Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Rob O'Malley of the Personal Genetics Education Project, or PG Ed. My pronouns are he and him, and I am a middle-aged white man with light gray hair and uh, a light beard. On behalf of PG Ed and our collaborators at the Center for LC Resources and Analyses, and our invited speakers, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Please feel free to introduce yourselves and chat and share what part of the world you call home. PG Ed is based in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School, and we strive for, to support inclusive and impactful genetics engagement that is people-centered and multidirectional. We seek to empower individuals and communities to share and learn from each other, to advocate for themselves in decision-making, and to enrich science as a whole, including in the practice and translation of research, in science education, in public discourse, and in policy. And educators have been our longstanding and valued allies in this work. That's why we're very excited to be partnering with Sarah to bring you today's program, the third in a four-part webinar series on exploring difference in the biology classroom. The first two events are viewable online at lchub.org on representing wide-ranging family structures and personal identities using the latest pedigree nomenclature and engaging with genetic disability and difference. Today's session is on what genetics ancestry testing, what genetic ancestry tests mean and what they don't. The use of these tests is widespread in the US. According to a 2019 Pew Research Center survey, roughly one in seven US adults say they have used a mail-in DNA testing service from companies such as Ancestry DNA or 23andMe. Today, we will discuss what genetic ancestry tests are and, what, and why they are of interest, but also their limitations and some misconceptions about what these tests can tell us about ourselves and what questions can arise about the use of these data. This topic is important because facilitating classroom conversations about genetic ancestry testing can be a powerful way to both connect scientific advances in the real world with lessons about human genetic variation and can support students in becoming informed consumers. We know that this is a challenging time to be a teacher for many reasons, um, and among them, it's a really demanding task to keep up with constantly evolving languages, approaches, and material um, in the sciences, particularly when it involves how we talk about people. Accordingly, we greatly value your choosing to spend some time with us today. We hope today's session will provide a useful framework to support inclusive pedagogy around uh, understanding these tests, um, both in classrooms and in more informal learning contexts. And in particular, uh, we're very grateful to our speakers um, who have deep expertise in both doing this research, understanding this research, and communicating this research the and the complexity of genetics as it relates to ancestry and human identity in a cultural and historical context. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm now going to hand things over to Dr. Sandra Sujin Lee to share about Sarah, present some housekeeping and a code of conduct for our time together, and to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone. It's great to see all the greetings in the chat um, and really looking forward to today's uh, exciting conversation. Uh, as Rob mentioned, I'm Sandra Sujin Lee. I'm co-director of the Center for LC Resources and Analysis, or CIRA, and professor of medical humanities and ethics at Columbia University. I'm really delighted that you have joined us for the third LC Conversations uh, event entitled What Genetic Ancestry Tests Mean and What They Don't. This session will run for an hour, and after the session ends, we invite you to stay for the optional discussion from 7 to 7.30 um, on classroom integration strategies facilitated by PG Ed. If you are interested and available to join for this section, please stay on this Zoom link and it will start uh, at, uh, at the top of the hour. In this session, we will hear from presenters, Dr. Janina Jeff, who is a population geneticist and senior scientist at Illumina and host and executive producer of In Those Genes, a podcast show that links genetics, African-American identity and black culture. We will also hear from Dr. Jada Ben Torres, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Genetic Anthropology and Biocultural Studies Laboratory at Vanderbilt University. The last half hour of the session will be dedicated to audience Q&A. 
So for those of you who may be new to the CIRA, we provide resources to support research on the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics and genomics. And we serve to connect scholars, educators, scientists, policymakers, journalists, members of the public, and others to engage LC issues. CIRA is funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH and is managed by teams at Stanford, Columbia Universities in partnership with the Hastings Center and the PG Ed team at Harvard University. We encourage you to join the CIRA mailing list to stay up to date on our future events in this collaboration series, as well as other ELSI conversations and access the resources that will be mentioned in today's session. The link uh, to, to that um, will be dropped in the chat um, and you should see it soon. And note that all links mentioned in today's session, including speaker and moderator biographies will also be linked in the chat. So now just for a bit of housekeeping, the session will be recorded and uploaded to lchub.org. You will be able to access the recording after the session ends by signing up for the CIRA newsletter, where the link to the recording will be distributed in a post-event email, or by visiting the Exploring Difference in the Biology Classroom page on lchub.org. We do have a professional live captioner uh, present to provide captions for today's session. Please use the CC button at the bottom of the screen to access closed captioning if you would like. Please note that if you do not activate the closed captioning at the bottom of your screen, the live captions will not be present, um, although they are available. Please use the chat box to ask questions. We will post links to references in the chat, and please feel free to add your own um, links to resources that you might know about. A recording of the session and all references posted in the chat will be available at lchub.org. And if you have any questions during the session, please email us at info at lchub.org. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our speakers today, uh, Dr. Janina Jeff and Dr. Jada Ben Torres, and I'm actually going to hand it off to Jada, um, who will uh, take it away. Thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can um, see the slides. Go. I think we are good to go. I think you all see PowerPoint. Um, so um, as mentioned, my name is Jada Ben Torres, and I'm a genetic anthropologist. Um, and today, I just want to talk to you all a bit about genetic ancestry testing, how I've used it in my own research, and some of my major thoughts, and uh, how you might incorporate some of the main, main questions um, about genetic ancestry, in particular, its relationship uh, to race within your classroom. So these are the three um, broad questions that I wanna cover today. I don't have too much time, um, but I do wanna talk about some of the benefits and, and the risks of participating in genetic ancestry testing. I, I wanna mention specifically the interpretive limitations. Um, there's a lot that's often sold and it's slick marketing, um, but what are you actually able to, to learn? And the last thing I wanna to mention is really about uh, the relationship between genetic ancestry um, and race and ethnicity. So with that, I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, so with genetic ancestry testing, these tests have been around for, for quite some time. Um, the first genetic tests uh, that were available to consumers were actually paternity tests. Um, and these remain some of the best selling tests. Uh, but increasingly, we are seeing in our storefronts, whether it's Target, CVS, any, any drugstore, the ability to buy a direct to consumer test. Uh, these tests, the genetic ancestry tests specifically, um, presumably they work by sending your DNA into this company and they'll make some comparisons and tell you something about where your ancestry is. So here I have a little screenshot of um, a, kind of a setup that I found in Target, um, as well as two screenshots from the marketing of, of different ancestry companies. And what you'll see what they have in common uh, is that they all uh, propose, propose to tell you something about yourself, to give you some insights about yourself that you might not know. So what do we actually learn from genetic ancestry tests? Well, we can look at the individual perspective, and we can also look at a population perspective. 
So as a consumer, uh, the individual perspective is what you might be most interested in. With those kits, you can actually learn something about the geographic origins of your ancestors. Uh, increasingly, with more numbers of people participating in these from um, a variety of different companies, you can actually find people you share DNA with, so biological kin. This actually opens up a whole nother set of questions with regard to the obligations we might have to people we share DNA with. What happens in the case of surprise siblings or um, other family secrets that are uh, unearthed? Um, and then lastly, uh, these genetic ancestry tests from an individual perspective, they can help to fill some gaps in genealogical records. And this is often what's featured in those TV shows like Finding Your Roots. We can also use genetic ancestry tests from uh, the perspective of the population. And as an academic, this is how I use ancestry tests. Um, much of my work focuses on these main questions, thinking about the mig migratory history of populations throughout, um, throughout the globe, uh, we can use deep ancestry to think about the common ancestry of our species. So not just, you know, people from a certain area of the world, um, but DNA has some insights in terms of how our species emerged and how they interacted with other hominid species uh, that, that have since gone extinct. Um, in my work, uh, specifically, I focus in, on the Caribbean. Um, and the questions that I ask is what can DNA reveal about the African ancestry or the experience of African uh, descendants in the Americas. I'm also very interested in using DNA to learn more about the experiences of indigenous Caribbean people. Um, using this sort of uh, perspective has been insightful for, for thinking about, uh, or actually just filling the gaps created by colonialism and the, and the transatlantic slave trade. I have um, work going on um, most recently in, in Puerto Rico. But getting back to commercially available genetic ancestry tests, there's a lot of things to be considered. I mentioned already some of the benefits in terms of what an individual consumer might learn about their own family. Um, but there's some things we also need to be concerned about. Um, first and foremost is privacy. How is your data going to be used? Who's going to, to um, have access to it? Um, and what might they learn about you? And not only will they learn about you, but what might they learn about uh, your family? For the most part, using direct-to-consumer uh, companies, they, they are in the market of keeping your information private. Um, because they are a business, they wouldn't make much money if they were selling all of your information to um, a variety of, um, of other players. That being said, there is research that does go on, so you do have to read the fine print and find out um, whether you opt in or out of, of research. Other individuals will upload their data to third-party applications, and that opens a whole other can of worms um, in terms of thinking about privacy. We also should be concerned with how the law enforcement uses um, public databases. Uh, you all have, uh, may have heard of cases where serial killers were removed um, from kind of circulation, they were caught, um, and it was because people were uploading their data but had not provided uh, co consent for that data to be used in that way. Um, in addition, when you upload your data, um, it's not just your information, it is your family information. So um, using DNA, we can identify you know, close family relatives, whether it's a parent, a sibling, or, or a cousin. And then one other aspect I think is important uh, to, to recognize is increasingly more information is, is available um, from our DNA. Our technology is just getting better at predicting uh, what we look like based on our DNA. Um, I can share this link with you, but there is a company, I have a little screenshot on the bottom right of Parabon Snap Snapshot, um, and they have a product that is available to a variety of police departments. Um, using DNA, they can predict what an individual looks like, um, and the idea here is to be able to cut down on the number of suspects that uh, the police have to investigate. Okay, so it's pretty cool technology, but at the same time, a little bit alarming, and this is something I think there needs to be wider discussions about. Now, in terms of interpreting genetic ancestry tests, as I mentioned, there are some limitations for it. Here I have um, kind of your run-of-the-mill pedigree. Um, and with these ancestry tests, there are different ways in which they work. There's uniparental tests, so that focuses on mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome DNA. Um, and then there's the autosomal test, uh, which focuses on the DNA that you inherit from both sides of your family. In my schematic here, you can see the uniparental test represented by mitochondrial DNA, so it's this little red circle. Um, and then uh, the Y chromosome is represented uh, by the, the, blue, the blue chromosome. 
right? Um, and what's important to see with these uniparental tests is that they give you some information only about one side or one part of your lineage, whether it's um, the maternal side or the paternal side. And then autosomal tests give you information uh, about your general ancestry. And that's based on the DNA that you've inherited from both, both parents. Um, another aspect of um, the interpretive li limitations with genetic ancestry testing is how results are returned, okay? Um, here in this screen, let me see if I can make this bigger. That should help, yes. So in this screen, you can see these are just random um, shots that I grabbed off the internet um, of, of people. Um, and you'll see that a lot of the results are often returned as percentages, oh no, as percentages, okay? Um, and the issue with that is that people like numbers. Um, they think of them as precise and exact. And in this case, um, it's important to remember that these numbers are relative to each company's reference database. So with these DNA kit kits, um, your DNA is compared to reference groups, okay? reference groups of people where we know where they were from. We know the geographic origin of their ancestors. Uh, so with these comparisons, you'll see that, oh, you know, X percentage of your DNA matches our reference group from a, this part of the world. When the reference groups changes, these numbers change, right? So sometimes people interpret that to mean that the tests are not accurate, um, but they are accurate only relative to uh, the comparative or the reference groups. And then all the companies have different reference groups, which is why if you test with multiple companies, uh, you can get different results. Again, it's not that the statistics are wrong, but it's just relative to the reference group. So what do people do with this information? Um, this is a, you know, a much larger, a larger topic um, and I could literally spend all day talking to you about this, um, but I'm gonna try and get um, you know, a really interesting anecdote across to you in the next two minutes. Um, so this is a case that I wrote about some years ago in a paper actually I've shared with you all. Um, and this is a story about a police officer who lived in Michigan. His name was Cleon, um, Cleon Brown, and he took an ancestry test. Okay? So prior to taking this ancestry test, uh, Sergeant Brown identified as a white male. Okay? After taking the ancestry test, he found out that he had some proportion of African ancestry. And he went to work and he told fam um, his, his uh, colleagues about this, after which point he began to be harassed um, people left nooses on his desk. They were, uh, he was left out of meetings um, and he was uh, basically really discriminated against. Um, he ended up suing and he won the settlement um, and then eventually found a new job. Okay? In the suit, you can look at this and uh, what it says is that the plaintiff is 18% African-American. Okay? And I wanna draw your attention to the parts that I've underlined. African American, uh, he goes from being a white man or identifying as a white man, taking this ancestry test, and then suddenly he's African American. What he actually means is that 18% of his ancestry can trace to Africa, right? It doesn't mean that he's African American. Another way of thinking about this is for many uh, African Americans, they have European ancestry. It's a, it's a kind of a consequence of the history of our, of our country. Um, however, they cannot identify as European American, and that's because of the social rules. Why is this important? Um, in terms of thinking about how this data can be used, um, it can be misused. Uh, we see a, a number of studies that I have screenshotted here uh, that shows how different white nationalist groups are using these genetic ancestry tests to um, uphold some very racist and wrong ideas with regard to race and, and ancestry, right? So the upside of all of this is that genetic ancestry testing can be useful to learn about the geographic origins of your ancestors, but it cannot tell you your race. Your race is something that you are socialized. It is constructed. Um, it is something that you, that you experience. Okay? Um, so that is my 10 minutes, and I'm happy to stay on and ask any questions, and I'll be able to participate in discussion for just a, a few minutes. So thank you all. Thank you. And then I think now we're going to uh, jump to um, Dr. Jeff, who has joined us. Uh, if she wants to, uh, Dr. Jeff, if you want to unmute, uh, you can uh, start whenever you're ready. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so apologies that I do not actually have slides. I have 
lost my computer in the last week. So I will be talking um, without slides today, but I think um, Dr. Torres has given a really, really good summary of genetic ancestry testing, particularly the definition of genetic ancestry testing and how they are used. Um, I do have a few clips uh, from a podcast that I'll play towards the end uh, of my 10 minutes, but I just want to get, I just want to get started off and give um, a little bit of an introduction as to who I am and some of the work that I do. So my name is Dr. Janina Jeff. I am a staff bioinformatics scientist at Illumina. Illumina is a genetic, it's a genetic technology biotech company that um, really creates um, genetic technology for companies like 23andMe and Ancestry, consumer genetic companies to use. So I work on the other end of this, which is um, I work on the development side of how do we create the test so that we can report results back like genetic ancestry. And so my work has really started um, before I got to Illumina doing my postdoc in population genetics. And during my postdoc in population genetics at the time, we were making correlations with genetic ancestry and different diseases. And so as Dr. Torres mentioned, we were taking um, what we now call, instead of genetic ancestry, a, a more accurate term would be genetic similarity. And so Dr. Torres mentioned that a lot of these companies will compare your, um, your genetics uh, with those, or your uh, ancestry with those that are in their database. So this is a relative, uh, comparison, but really what they're comparing is actually something that we call genetic similarity versus ancestry, since we know that it's really hard to almost impossible to really detect where exactly each of these populations um, are present day and even um, before then. And so sometimes the language, sometimes the language in science changes as especially as we evolve um, socially. And so what I do at Illumina, the test that is used to create these um, genetic ancestry reports are um, a part of a technology called genotyping. And you can think of genotyping as instead of having access to the whole genome. So if you were to think about your genome as a book and um, every letter in that book was only comprised of four letters that make up DNA, A, T, C, and G. Um, if you were doing if you were doing genotyping, you would have paragraphs from each of, from paragraphs in this book, but you would have enough paragraphs to be able to tell the story of what happens in this book. You would even have enough paragraphs to be able to compare the similarity of your book and other books that are in the library. And so that is similar to um, what a lot of genetic ancestry testing are doing and the type of, type of technology that they are using. That technology is called genotyping, which is the contrast from sequencing, which Illumina also sells, which is having every single letter in that book. And in this case, you can detect things like the typo of just one letter that is only seen in one book and not seen in any other book in the entire library. And so that's just one way um, to think about it. So that is my work at Illumina. Outside of Illumina, though, I do also have a podcast. And so I'm going to play a few clips from my podcast that kind of center around this topic. Um, and I'm going to leave some time. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of discussion after this. But um, my work in the podcast is basically how do we take genetics and how do we make genetics more accessible to everyone? And so language is an extremely big barrier um, to how we make genetics accessible. And I would even argue science as a whole. And so on our show, we try to use culturally relevant language to teach genetics, but most importantly, um, to make sure the entire community, the Black community specifically in this instance, has access to genetic information and genetic literacy, as do other uh, groups and populations. And so in this work, I have done a lot of, I've actually done an entire season on genetic ancestry testing, which will be um, in season one. And I wish I had time to talk about every single topic, um, but some of the things that we talk about in season one, uh, Dr. Torres has kind of mentioned, we go in a little, we go into more depth on that we don't have time to discuss today. And some of those are questions about how do we make predictions on um, 
someone's genetic ancestry or their background, how do we, how do different companies conduct their different tests? What are some of the legal obligations and what are some of the um, laws that are in place to protect you um, when you're doing a genetic ancestry test? How might you explain this to your elders? And then we have some personal stories as well for those who have taken a genetic test. We have an episode um, called Scientific Sleuths in um, the first season where someone used genetic ancestry testing to find 20,000 relatives. And so what does relatives even mean? And um, our podcast touches on all these topics. And in the very last episodes, I kind of give a personal take on what which um, test I think is best for which purpose, for different purposes. So I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, I just got a computer yesterday. So I have, bear with me that I, I mean, I know how to use it, but <laughs> of course things always change. Um, let's see, do I have access to share my screen? I think I- You do, yes. Okay. Hmm. Why do I have this little? Oh, hold on one second. Um, I do need to get access from the computer to share my screen because I have never used this before. Um, please let me know if this works. Oh, Dr. Jeff, you're muted. Oh, am I, am I still muted? No, no, you're back now. Okay. And you can see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. I guess not. Okay. Oh. So we can see your screen now. Okay. Please let me know if you can also hear the audio. Welcome to In Those Genes, a science and can everyone hear that. Okay, cool culture podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost identities of African descendants through the lens of black culture hosted by me. Together, we will learn, laugh and make genetics ours. Every week, I will break down complex genetic concepts to help us understand who we are through black culture. An admixed genome from African Americans looks like Ebola jambalaya, jollof, paella, Plus, we'll be having kitchen table discussions with kindred spirits who you'll meet along the way. So we come from a, a group of people who all send their daughters to <laughs> <Just film it. laughs> We'll address questions and concerns that exist within the Black community around genetics. I mean, you see the commercials and the lady pops on there. I'm 60% this and I'm 70% that. How valid is the result? This entire experience is dedicated to us. Not scientists that typically exclude us, the companies that target us, or podcasts that erase us. My English name is Dean Kalfani, which is a Swahili name. It's a, a freedom. Black don't crack. Africans are more diverse than the human population is. Hard fact. And a hard, hard fact, fact, full pause. And we'll always leave you with an affirmation. In every part of your DNA, you have this wealth of information. It is your duty to learn about it, protect it, and use it for good to create a generational well of knowledge about your identity. And that's how we plan to get in them genes. So that's just an introduction to, to, the, to the show. Um, I'm not going to play all of these, but I'm going to try and skip no, to um, this one, which describes how genetic ancestry tests work. All right. So tell me what it was like from ordering the test to getting your results. So, yeah, it was I think the price had dropped to like mm -hmm. from like a hundred something dollars to 75 or something like that. So you 79. out here checking for twenty four dollars. 
Yeah. I'm right. looking for the yeah. Mm-hmm. No, like, yeah, that's how you get. Yeah, me. I think ours was a hundred for two, so it was crazy. Oh, okay, so they really they really cheap. out here cutting deals. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a hell of a deal. Then it comes in the mail. It was like a special little box, right? Okay. You opened the box. It was cool because you opened the box and had a cool little presentation. It was like a it kit. was a cool presentation. It was like a kit. It was like a kit. You just pop open like it was oh, like this a Coachella cool. box, right? Exactly. It was it like, was. like <laughs> it was. It was. And how do you actually give a DNA sample? So you spit. How much spit are we talking here? It was. Like, like six like, ounces, four ounces, maybe not even. Was, like a not that tube. much. It was a two, two so it was like that's a lot of spit. It was two. like a, it was like three spits. I felt like. <laughs> Personally, haven't done samples from saliva before. It's not fun. It's not fun. So saliva one. is not is not the best way. It's to, not to isolate DNA. Oh, this is not high yield. <laughs> so there are several ways to get a DNA sample. DNA is in each one of the cells that make up the human body. Most common forms of samples include blood, saliva, hair, sperm, and even skin. But they do not all give the best quality DNA. The best way to extract DNA is from a blood sample. But obviously, this is not something you would do on your own for an ancestry test. So what you do is you spit. While this method does not yield a lot of DNA, after extraction, the data quality is good enough. Once there is enough DNA extracted, we can replicate the DNA and store it for future use, which is called biobanking. So after you spit, you ship it out, and then what? I guess it took like six to eight weeks or something to get it back. And while you were waiting, what results did you think you were going to get? Or what results were you hoping to get? I wanted a little bit of Ghana. Why? I wanted... <laughs> what kind of Ghana? <laughs> and so that is just one clip. And the last clip here um, comes from a TED Talk of mine. And I don't know how much time I have. So if I'm cutting short, I can actually, um, I can actually not, um, not, I can actually not do this one, but I don't see anyone sending me messages. So I'm going to go ahead and play. Uh, how short? It's about a, a minute and 45 seconds. Is that okay? Okay. Um, this is just me talking about how accurate the tests are. Dr. Torres has kind of talked about this. Um, but this kind of goes into an explanation of how we would kind of describe accuracy on the podcast. Once you send in your DNA, companies compare your data with other samples in their database to find similarities. Then they report to you how similar your data is with the samples from across the world. So if you can imagine where there is a lack of representation in the world, where you are from, what you get is the next best match, which is a reflection of the samples they have, but, not, but might not be your actual genetic ancestry. However, as companies add more data from across the world and redo the analysis, your match might change from the original prediction to a better prediction that might be more accurate. So the black culture parallel would be something like going to a cookout and everybody brings salad. Now, yes, salad is good. And in this example, salad is still food but it doesn't fully represent the food pyramid for a complete meal. In the context of genetics, here the salad would be European genomes. Still human, but doesn't represent world populations. But if different types of people come to the cookout, they will bring different foods that explain their lifestyle, culture, and thus diet. Then we start adding proteins like chicken and carbs like my infamous crawfish bread. This cookout starts to resemble a better representation of the food chain. The more people we invite, the more diverse the menu becomes. I mean, just think about the rice table. We got plain rice, jambalaya, paella, jollof, shrimp fried rice, basmati rice, literally a global representation. Now the cookout goes from a salad bar to a full-blown Brooklyn block party just by being inclusive. So like the cookout, the more genomes we add to the database, and more accurate, the more accurate the database is at reflecting human populations across the world. Okay, that was my last slide. Um, and a lot of these things we, uh, Dr. Torres has kind of mentioned. Um, so I will go ahead and stop here. I am here to answer as many questions as possible if you guys have more questions. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you, uh, Dr. Jeff and uh, Dr. Torres, for those great presentations, and uh, and definitely appreciate uh, Dr. Jeff your willingness to navigate this uh, computer free. Um, so they are with a with a new computer. So thank you, thank you for, very much for that. Um, so we're going to shift now to Q and A with the audience. Um, so I would invite everyone to uh, share questions in the chat box. 
We also have some that were submitted beforehand during registration and we'll um, pull from those uh, 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 and address as many as we can. And my uh, colleague from PGA, Dr. Nadine Vincenten, uh, will be joining to help moderate. And I will invite Nadine to maybe start us off with a question. Sure, thanks, Rob. And thank you to both of our speakers. It was super interesting and I don't envy the 10 minutes. It's a hard job to, <laughs> to get things across, but I think you've given us, at least from where I'm sitting, a great kind of overview and a lot of links to further explore. Um, so I've looked at all the questions that came in in registration and I'm gonna do a really annoying thing, or at least I often find it annoying, which is asking multiple questions at once, but it's just because they all overlap constant, like I keep seeing the same questions over and over again. And they're kind of asked from the perspective of, should I do an ancestry test with the students in my classroom? And this is a question that came in registration. We've, as our team, have had it from teachers from middle school on, on to college, like, should I do it? Which for me is already a question on its own, but the way it's, it's, it has been asked often and also on the registration was asked was two part. Some people are really concerned about accuracy and thank you both for touching upon it, but I wanna give you some more space if you feel like there are things you would like to say a bit more about because we do get that question constantly, like how, how valid is it? How accurate are they? The other angle is the concern of like, that a lot of students see ancestry as equivalent to race and are these tests like confirming that view? Uh, or strengthening that view and how can you kind of talk about that and explain how these two concepts are, at least from where I'm sitting, different. Um, so I'm gonna leave the floor to both of you if you wanted me to repeat any of it, of the questions, I'm happy to do so. Um, is this the same question that I see in the chat? Just asking, because is this are these separate questions? Uh, so I pulled these from the registration, but okay. it could be that by chance, similar okay. questions are coming up. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jeff, do you want to go or are you? Yeah, so I, I can go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm, I think I'm quite conflicted about this and, and Dr. Torres, let me know, you know, how you feel. Um, one of them, you know, should we use it in the classroom? There are some institutions that have already started using this. And my recommendation there is if it is used in the classroom, it should be used under the guise of like scientific teaching. And so I think that I have seen it been, being misused in the classroom. Um, I've had students reach out to me who told me their professors wanted to, wanted to do, um, was using like using consumer genetic ancestry tests as a means to like justify that race is real or justify that cultural ethnicity is somehow intertwined with biology. And so I think if it is used, it has to be used correctly. Another thing is it has to be directly communicated with the students. So actually one of the companies will, I have heard of one of these companies shipping out free genetic ancestry testing to classrooms um, for the purpose of learning and teaching. But what is not communicated to the students is that their data is you know, now ultimately could be used for research. Um, and as Dr. Torres mentioned, once you submit your genetic ancestry test, you're not just submitting yours, um, you're also submitting information on your family. You're also submitting information on behalf of your family without their consent. And so I think that this could be a really great learning tool, especially for biology and genetic students, but I don't think that um, I don't think that um, it should be used just um, without like um, without, correct structure and without a good understanding on both the students and the professor's side on what do we hope to gain from that? I actually agree um, with everything that Dr. Jeff has said. Um, I'm of the mindset that if you were to use this in the classroom, it should be for um, older students, ones that are prepared to read the fine lines. Um, and I think this should be done with guidance. Um, I have seen this done in classroom where um, it wasn't exactly clear that the, the instructor was really just, um, and that concerns me. I think the science is important. Um, whether you still should have a general idea of, of exactly what it is you are giving away and, and what you're getting. Um, so I think there are places for it in the classroom. 
Um, of course, just for older students, not definitely not high school. Um, there's also issues of, you know, sending this sort of information out for minors. And again, it's related to, uh, to the family. Uh, I think there are some really interesting questions that can be used or, or addressed. Um, in my own classroom, I don't necessarily have my students use companies. I've taught a class actually many years ago where the students just did their own ancestry, but it was in the privacy of my lab. So I was able to um, help them design their own test to, to do that. I realize not everybody has those resources. Um, another great exercise I've had students do is to actually go into the websites as much as you can on the, um, on the outside, really not being a consumer, um, and look, looking at how much information is actually provided, um, how much scientific information, how much sort of social ethical um, information is provided before you buy the kit. Um, and we do different assessments about that and you know talk, talk about how it's, how it's marketed. Um, thought there was a second question. Um, I saw a question about um, race and ethnicity, um, and if these um, um, if these tests are use useful for that. So as as I mentioned, not so much for race. Ethnicity gets a little bit tricky. Um, first of all, defining what you mean by ethnicity. Um, for the most part, I want to say no, but there are there is the case of um, being able to identify Ashkenazi or Sephardic. Uh, Jewish Jewish ancestry, we can think of that as, as ethnicity, or some people do. Cases because of the long sort of population practice of signatures. Um, but with regard to that, again, the question is, what do you do with it goes up in your ancestry? Um, there's the difference, you know, between ethnicity and culture and how those those relate. So again, genetics will get you so far. Uh, but we also have to understand that the context in which we live in is goes well beyond biology, um, that we're, you know, social beings and we've constructed these identities. Um, and sometimes they connect to biology and sometimes they don't. Um, thank you. Both of those uh, great uh, uh, reflections. Um, so uh, Lillian had a question um, uh, regarding uh, commercial genotyping agencies. Um, and I, I think, you know, when I've done these tests and I've done 23andMe, like it gives you like a map and it's, you know, and, and I think uh, Dr. Uh, ben Torres, you had a, an, an example slide of like, you know, all the percentages broken down. Um, do these companies, uh, I, I'm going to modify Lynn's question somewhat. Do these companies have a responsibility to maybe make sure that they're not reinforcing misconceptions about you know what these tests are are showing. Um, do they do a good job of doing that, or what? What things maybe would you like to see to make sure that these results uh, are being understood in the proper context? Like, is there, are there things that we might like to see um, to not reinforce, you know, biological or racial determinism for people receiving these tests? I think Dr. Jeff hit um, hit a, a great or made a great point with regard to um, a change in language. Uh, genetic similarity, it probably doesn't sound as slick, may not sell as well, but it's definitely more accurate um, where people have ideas of what ancestry means, as language and clothing and all sorts of other traditions um, that, that we inherit. In terms of the responsibility, you know, they are companies um, and they are also responsible to their stockholders, right? So we, we have to think about um, these companies as what they are, and and it, their enterprises to to make money, um, and yes, they can provide some um, some information to us. Uh, just because of like the slide I showed with regard to how the data can be misused, um, I think it's important. Um, it would be moral for these companies to to you know be a little more careful with their wording with regard to what they can actually tell you, um, but. Um, that that's not always the way the world works, specifically in, in the context of, of marketing and business. Yeah, actually, um, I, I have another clip. I didn't have time to play all these clips, but I have another clip that kind of answer well, kind of answers this. But the whole episode is about the marketing of genetic ancestry testing. And so um, the name of that episode is called Abigail's Story. And it tells a story of one of the companies uh, incorrectly, um, incorrectly advertising a narrative about genetic ancestry to its customers to engage mostly those in the Black community. And so in this, um, 
in this, we talk to someone who works in marketing to kind of walk through, well, where were the missteps taken and how did it make it this far? In short, this commercial um, shows a black woman being whisked away during slavery with a white man to Canada and it's painted as a love story. And um, I wrote an opted piece called 46 Chromosomes in a Mule right after that, that really broke down the genetics of why that narrative is more than likely not accurate and how falsely advertising a fairy tale story, particularly one that is, um, particularly one that's pushing a narrative that having some type of European ancestry is connected to a love story for an African descent woman um, is not true. It's not true. We've tested it in our genomes. We know that um, a lot of the European ancestry is overrepresented on the Y chromosome, which shows that that relationship was not random, similar to what we would expect if we were consenting to these relationships. And so there has been a lot of mismarketing um, a lot of mismarketing that has happened. In terms of like understanding, we have, like I said, I have another clip and if there's time in the end, I will play this clip that kind of talks about, you know, what exactly are we looking at? And what we're looking at is how our genetics or how our genomes compares to the ancestors before us and those ancestors and those ancestors and those ancestors and really tracing back to, um, to the similarity between someone who's not so closely related to us sharing the same common ancestor. And so the genetic similarity that me or someone else might have with having a common ancestor. So that's really all. Um, I do think the companies could do a better job because while these easy marketing tools are like low hanging fruit and really touching on social issues that exist um, within different um, different societies, I think there's also a huge opportunity to change how we talk about this into something that's very positive. You know, we are 99.9% .9 the same, and there's only 0.1% that makes us different. I think it's pretty freaking cool that this company can point out that little small percent that's different and really help us try to celebrate well, one, how cool is that? We can describe this 0.1% that's different from us, but let's talk about the extent to which it means. There was another um, company, I don't know, there was another actually airline company called Momundo, and they help you like get flights from to go different places. And they have a really nice, um, I guess, social experiment they did with genetic ancestry testing where they brought people in all across Europe and they all took genetic ancestry testing and everyone in the room is like, I'm German or you know, claiming I'm Italian, claiming their European ancestry and actually even talking about kind of the history of some of the um, wars that have occurred between different European countries, different religions, different cultural practices and actually showing that individuals in this room are related to each other. And so people who would never talk to each other would never associate with a certain race, ethnicity now has a relative who's sitting night, right next to them in the room. I thought it was a really beautiful story because instead of thinking about ways in which we can divide each other, um, this was using genetic ancestry testing as a way in which we can unite each other. And I thought it was a really positive story. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities that we can change the narrative and language and perception that can still, you know, not affect that, that bottom dollar sign that Dr. Um, ben Torres talked about. And so those are just some of my thoughts. Thank you so much. That's Super interesting and really helpful. I'm European myself, so that <laughs> that last story was super interesting to think about. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I saw some more pop up and we'll try, we'll maybe find some time in the next half hour, which is a workshop specifically for teachers to think about how we bring these things into the classroom. Um, I'm particularly seeing Paris's question. We might be able to address it there. But I wanted to highlight Tiana's question and maybe expand it a little bit. I mean, we've already talked about the companies and their responsibilities, but also as educators and geneticists more broadly, uh, do we have a duty to inform young people? And I would say anybody really, because I think most people don't think about this angle, uh, that as they want to do the test, they're also submitting their family's information without really their consent. Um, at least when I did a 23andMe, um, out of just like 
you know, interest because I, I work in this field and I want to understand how it works. Um, I was never asked, did your parents, were they okay with you basically also submitting their DNA? So how, you know, how can we raise awareness about that and how can we do it in a way that's digestible for people that they understand um, what that means? Um, I mean, I, I do think we have a responsibility to to talk about that. I think we have a responsibility to talk about. And I think one of the things, especially those who are working in academia have is, you know, you don't have that commercial pressure of, you know, representing a company. You actually have the opportunity to be very unbiased and truthful. And so I think it's an excellent opportunity to really be as transparent as possible. I think the students will only uh, gain from that. So what are all of the things that you can do with genetic ancestry testing results? And actually it'd be a great idea to even show the students how to do all of these things. There are a lot of online resources and tools where you can download your raw data and do things like connect, uh, do your own genome-wide association study, which is a statistical analysis where we make associations with regions in the genome and disease and phenotypes. And so I think there are a lot of things that we can show students that will be um, intellectually challenging and interesting while also being transparent about it. And again, students can learn these things without using their own genetic information. Um, there's plenty of reference data out there. I, I've taught some classes where I just pull thousand genomes, which is the major reference population that a lot of us use in genetics. Um, to teach these concepts. And then if someone decides they want to do that, then they can they can still choose to do it. Um, one thing I talk about in the TED Talk is how these companies, also, a lot of the companies will have you consent for research and then can sell your data um, for subsequent use for outside of just research, for pharmaceutical research, for develop, drug development. And so we have to communicate. I think it is, you know, we should want to communicate all of this um, with our students. And, and, you know, who knows, we could be teaching students, you know, and they could be so interested that they become the creators of technology that can better regulate some of the ethical challenges that we're currently undergoing. So I think it's a very positive thing. But I think one of the main issues that a lot of companies have had is being able to, um, being able to, uh, be transparent about how the data is used. I think um, those are all great points. My video was freezing, so I was turning off the camera. Um, but the, I think those are all great points. There is a lot to be learned. Um, this is not a technology that's going that we want us um, to know about so that they can make, make informed. I began to think um, more in depth about the issue of consent and what that means. When I do my own research, depending on the community I am working with, um, I always have to get individual consent, but sometimes I have to go and find an entity in the community that represents the community and get consent from them to even be there in the first place. Um, and some families work in similar ways, right, where decisions about uh, that any individual might make actually goes to, you know, a wider group of people. Um, so it really just depends on how it works in that family. So that's an excellent opportunity to think about what consent means, the process of consent, um, and what happens, you know, if, you know, you come from a tradition where group consent is not a thing, um, and someone decides to chip in and say, no, I don't want you to do this test, do you do it or, or not? So that's kind of an interesting question to, to also have your students consider. Okay, um, so fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for all of these um, reflections and engaging with these great questions. Um, we are uh, going to start shifting into the classroom integration part. Um, I do just want to personally thank uh, both Dr. Jeff and Dr. Ben Torres for um, uh, some really great uh, reflections and, and remarks. Um, both of you are absolutely willing to stay on um, as long as you can, as, as your schedule permits. If you need to jump off, that's fine too. Um, we do invite everyone to stay on um, for the uh, classroom integration strategies, which is usually about 30 minutes. Um, and uh, before we do that, I just want to welcome back Sandra to share some closing remarks from Sarah.
Yeah, thank you for a wonderful session. Um, before we transition into the next half hour of discussion, which will be moderated by PG Ed's uh, Jill McNeil, I'd like to share some resources that we're going to also put in the chat. So um, first, we'd like to invite you to register for the next event in this series that will take place May 11th at the same time as this session, 6 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the title of that session will be Beyond Mendel, Leading with Complexity When Teaching Human Genetics, and the registration link can now be found in the chat. We also want to invite you to subscribe to our newsletter for the latest events on our next LC Conversations uh, series, resources, and other things that have been mentioned today, um, as well as uh, other announcements, and you should find that link also in the chat. And finally, um, but importantly, we really appreciate your feedback. So please fill out our survey to discuss your experience and to make suggestions for future topics and speakers. Um, and again, uh, thank you so much to everyone at PG Ed, as well as our panelists for a great discussion. I'm gonna hand it over to Jill McNeil, who will guide us into a discussion on classroom integration strategies. Um, that conversation will not be recorded and we hope that you will join us there. Thanks everyone.